Now we're going to talk for a while about Asian American creators in the comics. That is to say, artists and writers and inkers and letterers and colorists and so forth. And we're going to start with the Golden Age, because that's where everything started, where comic books are concerned, right? So I have here uh, some images uh, from the people I could find images for. Kaim Wong, couldn't find a picture of him. Uh, he was a Chinese-American artist. Uh, I, so I, I put a, a sample of his work. He actually uh, uh, worked for, for Dell all through the uh, 1940. 50s, starting in the 40s, and he specialized in their uh, uh, cartoon license characters, and particularly the Looney Tunes characters, whose adventures he was the uh, he was the primary artist for for years, and then later he went into animation himself, uh, and in the 1970s he was working on uh, Fat Albert, uh, and he was on he was on the uh, ABC animation team. And in fact, uh, he worked on, as an animator, he worked on all 22 episodes of the 1970s Star Trek animated show, which that's enough to impress me. Bob Fujitani worked in uh, uh, comic strips and comic books. Uh, he, uh, in comic strips, uh, was kind of a pinch hitter. Uh, for including, other th among other things, Flash Gordon, which is uh, what he was most associated with so far as comic strips. And then he worked on many different titles. He worked on uh, Crime Does Not Pay. He illustrated uh, The Hangman Adventures um, over uh, in um, what would later be known as Archie Comics. Um, he, um, during World War II, being Japanese-American, he felt compelled not to use his full name, not to sign his full name on his works. So uh, his works were often signed Fuj, F-U-J-E. Paul Fung, Chinese-American artist, primarily worked in newspaper comic strips. Uh, he even had one of his own that he, he created, wrote, and drew that ran for several years in the 1930s called Dumb Dora. Uh, and then after that ended, uh, he uh, worked some in advertising, and in the early 40s, he did some comic book work. Now, I've got several names listed over to the side. Uh, Chu Hing, I didn't put his picture up again. We've seen him. He's the guy that created the Green Turtle, and he spent much of the 1940s working at Timely, where he was an inker and a letterer. Now, these other four, uh, John Yakata, Min Matsuda, Helen Cho, and Tung Li, um, they were also inkers and letterers. I couldn't find any, couldn't find any images for them. And I couldn't give you an example of their work because oftentimes inkers and always letterers and colorists back then during the Golden Age were not mentioned in the credits. I mean, in fact, nobody was usually mentioned in the credits, the credits except in some cases the creator of the character. Um, in fact, it wasn't until the 1960s that Marvel started giving the uh, listing the full credits for all those jobs. DC didn't start doing it until the mid-70s. My point is, we don't even know for sure what things that they worked on. We only knew that uh, they were uh, they were working there. I think Yakata and Matsudo worked uh, at the uh, Charles Biro studio, so they probably were also doing some crime comics-related stuff. I did find a reference to a Min Matsuda from uh, living in New York City uh, in the 19, late 1960s, who would have been around, around the same age. So uh, I'm not sure how many men Matsudas there would have been in New York City. Uh, but if it is the same person, she, uh, she became an activist, kind of a, uh, but she organized, uh, helped organize a group, Mothers Against Vietnam, uh, in, in New York City. So anyway, unfortunately, those folks mostly have been forgotten uh, 
even to the extent that, uh, you know, if you come across their names, it's hard to find too much else associated with them. Now, all these folks got into the comics business in the golden age in the early 1940s. And that was largely uh, for the same reason that so many women were able to break in and African-Americans were able to break in at a greater rate. And that's because the war was going on. And so many of the regular uh, artists and, and writers had been, had been drafted, opening up some opportunities perhaps for, for women and minorities that might not otherwise have been available at that time in the comics business and that might not have been available later. So you see this kind of a wave of uh, Asian and Asian American creators in the early 1940s that you don't see that repeated for a long time. Now, uh, I've saved four people in particular to talk about when we're talking about the Golden Age. All four of them, letterers. Um, and um, several of them also occasionally working as inkers. These four got their start also early 1940s and were doing, you know, with people I just talked about for, for the most part didn't get to do the penciling, right? Uh, the penciler might get some credit. Uh, so they were mostly doing the, the inks and many times not even getting to that level. Right, just doing the doing the lettering. Now, these guys kind of stand out because they had fairly long careers. Uh, several of the people I just mentioned were out of the business by the end of the 1940s. Uh, these guys managed to uh, uh, get their spot when that spot was open during World War II, and then hold on to it. In, in three of the four cases. Uh, for the rest of their lives, actually. So, Ben Oda, who was uh, Japanese-American and fought in World War II. Uh, he was a paratrooper. Um, he got uh, into the comics business after the war, when he got home. And he was, um, uh, he was working, doing work for several different companies, but the one that he kind of landed and stuck with was DC, DC Comics. Uh, essentially, he spent about 40 years as a letterer at DC Comics, and during that time, he was one of the most prolific letterers. Um, he had a, a lot, a lot of credits. And, uh, you know, he was still working, still working there when he passed away in 1984. Irving Watanabe, um, something similar. He, he wound up getting on at Marvel and worked there well into the 1980s. And I think he was still doing some occasional inking when he passed away in 1993. Now, Fred Ng... Uh, didn't have as lasting a career with mainstream comics. Uh, he did get on it timely in the 1940s, and he worked for Timely, and then he continued when they were Atlas. He also, in the beginning in the early 40s, uh, did work for Classics Illustrated uh, for for many many years. Now he was actually a uh, an immigrant himself. He was 13 or 14 years old when his family moved, uh, moved here from, uh, from China to New York City. And he was, uh, he was fascinated with calligraphy, which is something that I think a lot of these uh, people who became letterers had in common. And I've, I've wondered sometimes if Asian culture might have lent itself more to that sort of work, uh, particularly with the great amount of honor that's attached and respect to calligraphy. And then I stop myself and say, well, it could also be because that's all they were allowed to do. And it might be making some cultural uh, stereotypes and assumptions to be, uh, to be thinking uh, that way and making that connection. But it was true in, in Ng's case, and it may have been true in some of these other uh, individuals. So, uh, 
He started off as a sign painter and eventually became a letterer. He quit the comics business in the late 50s and went into animation. The fourth person here, Mori Kuramoto. Uh, much like Irving Watanabe and Fred Ng, uh, got, got his start at Timely Comics in the 1940s. Stayed with them when they became Atlas. Um, managed to hang in there uh, as, as a freelancer at some points uh, in the late 50s until, you know, Marvel kind of uh, made their turnaround. And uh, then he stayed with them when they were Marvel all the way up until his death in 1985. And by that time, he was not just a letterer. And for about 20 years, he had not just been a letterer. He was, he was essentially in charge of uh, uh, production. So anything that came up uh, with the, uh, you know, the physical layout and uh, physically putting things together, he could pinch hit for. And he was, uh, he was well known by really generations of people who worked for Marvel Comics. And he was... Uh, he was remembered as a really nice guy um, who had a habit of always uh, wear, wearing a raincoat to work and hanging it up in, in, in the, on the coat rack there and, and always having a cigarette going, even though he usually wasn't smoking it. And there's a story uh, that uh, took place in the late 1970s. So he would have been, you know, late 50s, almost 60 years old that um, he was often one of the, he was one of the only non-white people in the office. There were only a couple of others. Um, Christopher Priest, probably around that time, alias Jim Owsley was one of them, maybe. This is the late 70s. But uh, every year, every year on Pearl Harbor Day, all the other folks working in the office would... Uh, uh, do a cartoon or several cartoons uh, kind of uh, making fun of uh, Kuramoto for his Japanese ancestry, uh, always making comments about it. Uh, and finally, uh, someone did a, uh, a cartoon of him in a Japanese zero plane um, attacking like the Empire State Building or something. I don't remember exactly. And he just kind of snapped. He just, this usually quiet guy, just kind of snapped and with tears of rage just went off on them, reminding them that uh, he was not Japanese in the sense of uh, from Japan. He was American and that he had fought he was one of the Nisei troops whose family was uh, in, a, in an internment camp uh, while he served in the U.S. Army and fought the Germans in Europe, uh, in, in Italy, and, and marching northward, which, you know, caused a lot of, uh, lot of, lot of shame there among the people who had been who had been making fun of him until they finally kind of pushed him to the point that he boiled over, and they didn't do that again. And uh, the story is that uh, after he passed away, around the same time that Ben Oda did, which was really interesting. I remember as a, I was in my mid-teens, 16, 17 years old, and I remember seeing these, um, these loving editorials in the pages of both Marvel and DC for each of these guys respectively. But the story is, they left his raincoat uh, hanging there for years afterward. All right, well, like I said, um, there were not subsequent waves of Asian Americans coming into the business, but these guys hung on, those the four that I just talked about. So you get into the 1970s, uh, they're still there. Uh, but there weren't too many younger Asian Americans, except for except for this guy, Larry Hama, who, uh, after his second tour of duty in Vietnam, um, got on 
at Wally Woods Studio. Um, I should probably show that uh, show that picture I've already used twice, right? Um, there he is on the left. But um, uh, shortly after that, he started uh, started working at Marvel. His his first Marvel credit was uh, an early issue of uh, the martial arts comic book Iron Fist. And then he worked his way up um, from being um, an artist and writer to an editorial assistant to an editor by the end of the 1970s and was an editor at Marvel for years afterward and since then has worked for various different companies. He's still working. Um, he uh, particularly is associated, although he's done a lot of stuff, particularly associated with war comics um and the punisher is kind of like a war comic right because he's supposed to be a a, a veteran a combat veteran who just keeps fighting his war uh, hama edited uh, the series called the nom which was critically acclaimed a uh, it would have fit in well with uh, it's the sort of thing you would have expected from ec if they'd still been making comics in the 1980s He's most closely associated, though, with G.I. Joe. Now, some of you may not be aware of this. You may not remember. But once upon a time, there were not 500 gazillion G.I. Joes. There was just the one guy, G.I. Joe, the action figure, in the 1960s. Um, and then, you know, in the late 60s, early 70s, like everybody else, he got a little bit hippie-ish. Uh, even G.I. Joe grew a beard. Uh, and then he had some occasional hangers on. Um, but it was when the G.I. Joe uh, a line was relaunched by the toy company in 1982 with the smaller action figures, not the 12-inch ones anymore, but the ones more like it, more in keeping with what was becoming common at that time, that they decided G.I. Joe was actually the name of an organization, right, with a lot of different members. Larry Hama was brought on uh, as Marvel made the licensing deal with G.I. Joe to make a G.I. Joe comic to be closely associated with a G.I. Joe animated series. Um, Hama came on as writer and editor and created many of the characters that people associate with G.I. Joe. Those that weren't created by him but were created by the company he developed their personalities. He developed their characters into what they would later be uh, known as. And he did that for the entire run of the comic book, which I forget. Uh, but it was like 150 issues. It was well into the mid-90s, I think, when it finally uh, finally ended. And he still, uh, still is closely associated with, with G.I. Joe. Now... I've mentioned him several times already. Uh, I mentioned him once in conjunction with Christopher Priest, alias Jim Housley, right? Remember him? He was the, uh, the first African-American comic book editor. Uh, and he came on as an assistant editor working uh, under the direction of Larry Hama. And he tells a story, Priest does, tells the story of uh, when he first started at Marvel, uh, for one thing, Larry Hama went to bat for him and uh, managed to, uh, to to get him a deal where he, he got health insurance. Uh, and then Hama took him out for lunch. And so they went to a restaurant, and they're uh, waiting to be seated. And some some white folks came in and demanded to be seated immediately. And the waiter was going to do it, and Hama stepped forward and in a very, very firm, no-nonsense way said, absolutely not. We were here first, and we'll be served first. And they were. And when they sat down, the priest recalls, Larry Hama said to him, don't ever let white people push you around, because if you let them, they'll keep doing it. And that is uh, 
Well, that is a, a really good story to illustrate Larry Hama's personality because he still has, has that approach in the sense that he is very, very outspoken about racial injustice in uh, comics or in the world around us. And uh, he, has, uh, he has been targeted by the comics gate uh, hyper uh, conservative folks who hate all the diversity uh, that now exists in comic books. Um, and the reason he's been targeted is because he very publicly says exactly what he thinks of them. So uh, I always admired Larry Hama's work. Um, but I have come to admire him as a person a lot more. Uh, in recent years, now that I've got to know more about him. All right, well, this brings us to uh, a whole different story and a, an Asian group that we haven't talked about yet. Actually, hold on a second. Before we do that, I almost forgot a couple of very important Asian American artists who came on the scene in the 1980s. So let's look at them briefly, and and then we'll we'll move on to that different Asian group that we haven't talked about. So um, Stan Sakai to begin with, who was uh, born in Japan, immigrated to the United States as a young man and first came on the scene in independent comics in 1984 as an as a letterer but within a couple of years by 1986 over at mirage comics which was one of the indie companies the one that published teenage mutant ninja turtles he created the title and the character usagi ojimbo which is a uh, uh a very serious historical samurai epic in which the characters happen to be animals. Um, the, uh, the lead character being, being a rabbit and very, very critically acclaimed and well received. At this point, uh, as of the year 2020, Stan Sakai has won six Eisner Awards, four of them, for his lettering. Also, Ron Lim, a Chinese-American artist originally from California who was hired on by Marvel uh, beginning in 1987 doing uh, Silver Surfer. And then he would be, become well-known for uh, not just Silver Surfer, but most of Marvel's quote-unquote cosmic heroes and titles, particularly the... Uh, the Thanos trilogy in the early 1990s, written by Jim Starlin. All right, now, now let's look at that very different kind of story. This story starts in the Philippines in 1948, which was the year that Tony DeZuniga, at the age of 16, went to work for... Li Weiwei, which is a Filipino magazine that uh, is, has been around forever, that has all kinds of different types of features, uh, but uh, comic strips are included uh, within it. Uh, and he started getting work there as a letterer, and he met a couple of, uh, a couple of guys that were a few years older than him who were uh, artists, Alfredo Alcala, and Nestor Redondo, um, they uh, would later, well, actually, Nestor Redondo uh, started the same year that the Dezuniga did. Uh, Alcala had been there for a while. Uh, Alfredo Alcala, by the way, would, uh, would become one of the most prominent comic book artists in the Philippines. Um, he, had, uh, he had, I think, a magazine named after him in the 1960s. Anyway, these two guys would become mentors to Tony DeZuniga, uh, and he also would become an artist. And 20 years later, more than 20 years later, 1969, he emigrated to the United States. 
and got he started working in in comic books uh and in particular he got uh, he got some work from from dc comics and he sort of uh, uh sort of focused on um horror initially and uh, uh he met the editor joe orlando remember him uh from he was one of those uh, artists at ec who had uh uh, a very uh, storied career, no pun intended. And uh, by the late 60s, early 70s, Joe Orlando was editing DC's new horror stuff, right? House of Mystery, Swamp Thing, and so forth. Um, De Zuniga got, uh, got some assignments in a, 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 a Western horror comic called Weird Western Tales. And he co-created, uh, as the artist part of the combo, um, the character Jonah Hex, who became extremely popular very quickly. So, uh, over on the far right is Carmine Infantino, who was the editorial director at DC by this time. Um, De Suniga in a conversation with Orlando, uh, learned that um, they were using a lot of reprint material, um, a lot of filler material for a lot of their books in which they were reprinting old stories that were in some cases like, you know, 20 years old or even even older. And Dezuniga asked, well, why don't you just have new stories and new art? And Orlando's answer was that the budget didn't allow for it uh, with what budget they had with the books they were doing, um, doing some calculations. It would take the best, the most they could pay, um, they could spare was uh, $12 a page. Uh, and no one's going to work for that. No one would have worked for that probably 20 years earlier. Uh, so they were using the reprint material. Uh, De Zuniga said, I know plenty of people that would uh, be happy to get that that amount of money uh, back in the Philippines where, you know, comic books are a really big thing. Well, um, Orlando told Infantino about this, and Infantino has told two different versions of, of the story. In one version, he says that they, they had a shortage of good artists. Uh, in another version, though, he has said that there was a rumor going around that Neil Adams, who was their star artist, the guy that had worked on, was working at this time on Batman and on Green Lantern. Uh, Neil Adams, a uh, really strong union guy uh, and really big into creators' rights. Uh, there was a rumor that he was organizing an artist's union and that they were going to focus specifically on D.C. And so... Uh, Infantino wanted to have some other artists lined up just in case. So either way you slice it, Filipino artists sounded cheaper. Um, so, hey, you know some other people? Great. Uh, a trip was planned and carried out to the Philippines in 1971. Uh, De Zuniga, Infantino, and Orlando traveled there together and met with all the artists that De Zuniga knew and had worked with and just kind of sent the word out for any artists uh, that wanted to do freelance work for an American company to come and, and show them uh, what they can do, you know, to bring their portfolios. And a lot of them did. Uh, and as a result, uh, deals were struck. And so the deal was the budget only allowed up to $12 a page. Um, the deal that was offered to these artists in the Philippines was $10 a page. And someone was going to be there, De Zuniga, to begin with as a point person to coordinate it all and kind of set up a studio, you know, like the Eisner and Iger Studio or the Bureau Studio, set up a Filipino uh, studio to create stuff for DC. And so that person, De Zuniga, 
um, would get the two extra two dollars per page as as their their percentage. And um, the Filipino artists were happy with that because that was a lot more than than they were used to making. And so quite a few of them started producing work for DC Comics. And of those who did, many of them, many of the ones who uh, were more successful, uh, moved to the United States, immigrated to the United States later on in the 1970s. So you already had De Zuniga. Uh, he very quickly brought on board his two mentors, Alcala and Redondo, um, both of whom, both of whom wound up focusing on horror and fantasy. Redondo uh, took over the uh, penciling on Swamp Thing. Uh, Alcala, actually, he wound up uh, after he moved to the U.S. doing more work for Marvel, particularly in their black and white magazines, um, especially the uh, Savage Sword of Conan. Conan the Barbarian. He also worked on the regular four-color comic version of, of Conan, became associated, actually, with that character. And in addition to them, you also had Alex Nino. Uh, again, he several, several of these folks, most of them, wound up focusing not on the superhero stuff, but on the fantasy, sword and sorcery, uh, and horror end of things. Uh, Jerry uh, Talowak, who did the same thing. He did House of Mystery for a while. The uh, big exception to this was Romeo Tangal, who focused mainly on superhero stuff. And uh, he did the uh, backup Robin feature in the Batman comics. And uh, later, uh, of course, Robin became Nightwing. So uh, you had all these guys. This was, well, it's, it's been referred to. It started being referred to at the time as the Philippine Invasion, which was kind of a, uh, you know, kind of a, a joke, kind of a play on words from the British Invasion, which was all the British rock and roll stars that had come over in the 60s. Um, that word is kind of, that's kind of a loaded term. Filipino wave, I think, might be more appropriate. But several of them, th these are just uh, some of the ones that... Uh, were most prominent. There were a, a lot of others as well that wound up working at the other companies. Uh, one more that I'll mention that was part of this group was Ernie Chan, who um, uh, also, uh, like Alcala and uh, Redondo, wound up doing stuff. Redondo also. Uh, they wound up working on the various different Conan titles. So Chan... Uh, either penciled and inked the stories himself, or, more often, he was the inker for John Buscema, who was the artist most closely associated with Conan the Barbarian. So here's a couple of uh, here's a couple of drawings that uh, that Chan did of Conan the Barbarian. The first one in 1977, and the other in 2010, and he added a self-portrait there. Uh, over uh, Conan's shoulder, there to the right and to the left, that's John Buscema, the uh, the famous art team. I think Buscema had been passed away for several years when when this was drawn, and Chan actually passed away not long afterwards. So that is a big Asian and Asian American because uh, many of them got citizenship uh, impact in the 1970s. Now most of these guys. Um, with Alcala and Chan being uh, notable exceptions, um, didn't last long into the 80s. Uh, but many of them went to work uh, in animation. Uh, and uh, I think it was Redondo that wound up uh, going to work uh, for Sega Games. Anyway, uh, so when... When you look at the Asian uh, presence, Asian American presence in comics, essentially in the, in the 1970s, you had those those three uh, Japanese American letterers who had been around since the 40s. You had Larry Hama, and you had these Filipino artists, 
and it's really hard to, to, to find anyone beyond that until the 19, late 80s and 1990s. Now, that started to change in the late 80s, and you had more uh, Filipino artists coming, and you had uh, Asian Americans, Korean Americans, uh, Japanese Americans, uh, becoming very prominent. Jim Lee, co-founder of Image Comics and later vice president of DC Comics. Uh, Gene Luen Yang, we've talked about a couple of times already. Uh, and once you hit the 21st century, just like all the minority groups and the, the, the women who aren't a minority group, right? They're the majority, really. Uh, but uh, all, of those, um, all those different non-white male groups started getting much more representation after about the year 2000. So just like with those other groups, I'm overwhelmed trying to think of a list or, or even picking out a best of for, for those folks. Uh, so just to give you an idea, uh, I, I'm putting up this uh, table of contents for this, uh, this anthology, this comic book anthology came out, I think, in 2014. Uh, the Shattered, the Asian American Comics Anthology. There's got several different uh, stories. And all these people are active uh, in the comic book industry. Marvel, DC, Image, Dark Horse, uh, Dynamite. Other, uh, other companies, uh, the, the companies that are prominent now. And as you can see, there are a lot of them. Uh, just scanning over this, you can see Greg Pak. He's the guy uh, that uh, I think is, is doing the, the new agents of, of Atlas. Well, uh, two people, though, that, that I do want to, to single out to, to conclude this part with. Uh, two women that I've mentioned before when I was talking about women in comics. T. Bowie, who is Vietnamese-American, who won much critical acclaim for her uh, graphic novel, The Best We Could Do, which is just excellent. And Marjorie Liu, um, she was in uh, on the table of contents of that girls' comics thing that we looked at that Marvel did, and didn't have a picture of her. So here's a picture of her, and here is a picture of her image series. She's done a lot of stuff for Marvel and I think some stuff for DC. And this particular series for Image um, won her the Eisner Award for Best Writer. And in the now 32-year history of the Eisner Awards, there had never been a woman who had won for Best Writer until Marjorie Liu, whose uh, uh, father is from Taiwan and mother uh, is, I think, uh, uh, from the United States. Uh, she was born in the U.S. So, anyway, uh, lots, I mean lots, of influential and impactful Asian American artists and writers working in the industry today. And lots of characters as well. 